Good evening. Welcome to the Salem Area Mass Transit District's Board of Directors meeting. Today is August 26, 2021, a little after 6.30 p.m. We're here convened at Courthouse Square in the Senator Hearing Room, and this meeting is called to order. Um, I will, or Ms. Galeazzi is noting the attendance, and I'll note um, that um, Director Wynn is excused from tonight's meeting. And then uh, I'll go ahead and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next, I'll ask uh, General Manager Pollock to um, lead us in a safety moment. Thank you. So I'd like to uh, focus my safety moment tonight on the governor's order that becomes effective tomorrow uh, for outdoor mass mandates. Uh, so uh, for those transit riders that are listening, you know we've uh, had a mask mandate on the bus and in our transit center offices uh, ongoing, but beginning tomorrow, it's back to the transit centers with masks. So if you do come, please have your mask on before we uh, uh, you come on, on site. I also would like to note for the audience, um, if you haven't heard that the TSA, the Transportation Security Administration, has extended the mask mandate on buses, trains, and uh, airplanes uh, until January of 2022. So we will continue to be wearing masks uh, on the bus and in our customer service center uh, for the remainder of the year until any changes in the effective date. And uh, that concludes my safety message. Thank you, General Manager. Um, next, we'll proceed to the announcements, and I have one announcement that I'm very happy to make uh, this evening, which is for the first time in our district's history, we'll be offering Sunday service uh, to riders throughout the community. So that will happen on 13 of our Chariot's local routes beginning on September 5th. And most routes will be operating on 60-minute service between 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And on the four Saturdays in September, the ride is on us. So no fares will be charged on September 5th, 12th, 19th, and 26th. And as a reminder, as General Manager Pollock just mentioned, masks are required uh, by the TSA, and that uh, mask requirement has been extended until January 18th, and that includes wearing a face mask on the bus, buses, planes, trains, and other forms of public transportation. So very excited to see uh, Sunday service start here right around the corner. And uh, we'll go ahead and proceed to the presentation portion of our agenda. And first up is an award. General Manager. Yeah, so thank you. I'd like to ask uh, Patricia Feeney, our Director of Communication, uh, to come forward to present this award uh, to the board. Thank you, General Manager Pollock. Director Davidson, members of the board, please join me in congratulating Transportation Options Coordinator Kiki Doman. She is the 2021 recipient of the President's Award for Extraordinary Leadership to the Association for Commuter Transportation. ACT, as it is known, is the premier organization and leading advocate for commuter transportation and transportation demand management professionals. The Leadership Award recognizes a member who has made significant contributions to the association through leadership and engagement in the ACT's board, chapters, councils, and committees. Now this is impressive. <laughs> Kiki has been a member since 2009, serves on the National Board of Directors, is vice chair of the National Impact Leadership Committee, a national member of the Professional Development Committee, and vice president of the Cascade Chapter covering Oregon, Washington, Alaska, and Vancouver, British Columbia. And this year, of interest to this board, she was asked to chair ACT's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Kiki, would you please join me? She was honored earlier this month with the President's Award at the annual International ACT Conference held in Orlando. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Thank you, Director Feeney and President Davidson, members of the board. Thank you for inviting me here tonight. Um, this was an incredible surprise. Um, I was humbled and honored to be recognized with this award um, at the International Conference earlier this month. 
Um, it's just been an incredible experience um, being involved with this association and incredibly grateful for Chariot's support and management um, encouraging me um, and supporting my involvement with the association. And it's been an incredible experience and journey. So thank you again for having me here tonight and all, the, all of your support. Yeah, many congratulations. Not thank only you. is that a beautiful award, but it's well earned. Yeah. So. Oh, well, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. And then I think that's We'll pass it around and we'll get it. We'll make sure it gets back to you. <laughs> we promise. It's a, it's a whopper. <laughs> it's heavy. Yeah, very heavy. Um, next up is a T-Best demonstration. Yeah, thank you. So I, I see Ted Stonecliff is on the screen. So Ted will be uh, making this presentation on this tool that we use uh, at, at the district. So Ted. Thank you, John, General Manager Pollock, President Davidson, and members of the board were excited to pre present the details of what, what is called transit boarding's estimation simulation tool, or for short, T-BEST. Next slide. Uh, in the presentation tonight, we'll give a brief introduction of T-BEST, including a background and history of the software and why this is a wonderful tool that we have acquired and will help chariots uh, greatly in the future. We'll give examples of the analyses we can do with this software tool, including, for example, how we have worked with the City of Salem on their climate action plan to study the benefits and costs of adding business access, access transit lanes or bat lanes uh, to uh, a network that we've modeled for them. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, the long range transit plan project and how TBEST will be involved there and take any questions that you may have at the end of the presentation. Next slide. A little bit of the background and history of T-BEST. Uh, T-BEST was developed about 20 years ago uh, by the Florida Department of Transportation in partnership with a university research group, the Center for Urban Transportation Research at the University of South Florida. Uh, today, it, the software is developed, implemented, and technical, technical support is provided uh, by a consulting firm with, uh, which we worked with called Service Edge Solutions. Next slide. Uh, TBEST provides transit data analytics and insights to support transit service planning and strategic transportation planning initiatives. In a nutshell, uh, TBEST gives us the ability to study alternatives to the chariot's local and regional networks using actual data sources such as the U.S. Census demographic data, employment data from the Oregon Employment Department, and real ridership data uh, from our system uh, at the route level and stop level ridership uh, that's provided by our onboard automatic passenger counters. Uh, in the middle of the slide, you can see some of the T-BEST features, um, including transit demand estimation, market analysis, uh, operational analysis, equity analyses for Title VI, um, accessibility, and jurisdictional analyses. Uh, T-BEST is maintained by the Florida Department of Transportation, uh, but it is acceptable for agencies outside of Florida to utilize TBEST. Uh, it is a free software download, uh, but you must have a basic license of GIS installed for it to work. And of course, uh, you need to have all of the census and employment data uh, calibrated and imported in order for it to be useful. Uh, next slide. Uh, so you might ask why we have TBEST. Uh, how is it different from some of the other tools that uh, are available to us. Uh, we use Trapeze software for short-term planning and scheduling, and that's the zero to one year time horizon. Uh, Cube and Stops are well-established long-range modeling tools uh, uh, for the 
the 20 plus year time horizons. But TBEST really fills the, the gap in between uh, with five to 10 year planning analyses. And it can also provide uh, the 20 year estimates. Next slide. TBEST integrates the Chariots Transit Network uh, census and land use data with fare policy and observed ridership. These data are validated and used to evaluate system and route performance, implementation costs, service and jurisdictional equities, access to and from transit, and the market served. It's a powerful tool that will enable the district to use a data-driven approach to communicate alternative analyses, Title VI specifications, strengthening our applications for certain state and federal grants, assisting with developing our strategic vision, and supporting any future potential ballot initiatives the board decides to pursue. Next slide. This slide shows uh, the network editor inside TBEST and uh, we're editing route two just as a uh, hypothetical here in the eastbound direction. The network editor can be used to make modifications to a route's alignment and our schedule. Uh, it's a, a user friendly interface uh, where we can add or remove stops, compare the benefits and costs to our changes, uh, and uh, we can also export these data into ArcGIS uh, via shapefiles. Uh, we can look at them in, in Google Maps and uh, it's, it has very um, a lot of export tools to, uh, that are compatible with other mapping softwares. Next slide. We can also get service summaries for any route in the chariot system. And this slide is showing a summary for Route 5, Center Street. Uh, it includes statistics such as the service span, total weekday service trips, and average headways. Uh, we can also get summaries for Saturday and Sunday service profiles uh, with this tool. Next slide. In this map, uh, the population densities of low-income households in the Chariot's local service area, defined as a quarter mile from our transit stops, is displayed. Uh, it shows that our existing network has good access for low-income people. Uh, we can create maps for any network and compare alternatives in order to better understand the benefits and or costs of each alternative with respect to any socioeconomic data type collected by the U.S. Census Bureau and the Oregon Employment Department. Next slide. Now this shows an example of a market analysis for employment on our Route 21. It shows the distribution of jobs within a half mile of transit stops on Route 21. Uh, you can see the table where a total of 7,611 jobs are accessible from Route 21. Uh, this could be done for multiple routes or the entire system. Uh, this is just an illustration of a single route. Next slide. Uh, here we show an example of a race and ethnicity socioeconomic market analysis for the Chariot's local routes in October 2019. The market area is defined by the purple bubbles within a quarter mile of every bus stop in that map. The numbers in the percent market area column on the table to the left uh, represent the percentage of each race who live within a quarter mile of a, bu of a bus stop. And the percent service area column shows the percentage of each, ra each race uh, that is within a quarter mile of a bus stop and who live within the Salem and Kaiser urban growth boundary. For instance, uh, this shows that the black population is 3,201 who live within a quarter mile of the Chariot's local bus stops. This is 1.8% of the total population uh, within that quarter mile uh, service area buffer, uh, but it's 75.3% of the total black population living inside the urban growth boundary. 
Uh, this shows that our buses are serving the ethnic populations inside the Salem-Kaiser UGB very equitably. Next slide. Uh, this is an example of an alternative analysis that we did for the Salem to Albany uh, feasibility study. We tested two scenarios in this project. Scenario one uh, was an express bus option, point to point service between Salem and Albany with very, very few stops in between. And the inner city uh, option is scenario two where uh, cities such as Jefferson and Millersburg were served. Uh, we used TBEST to compare populations served, uh, access to employment and service characteristics. It, it's summarized here, but on the very last line there, uh, you can say, see the estimated annual ridership and that's for the, the entire chariot system. It's not just for a single route. Uh, uh, but you can see scenario one is slightly less than uh, scenario two. Uh, the, the inner city option was chosen by the consultant in their final recommendation, and this supports that recommendation. Next slide. Uh, we can use TBEST for Title VI equity analyses, uh, looking at disparate impacts to ethnic minorities or disproportionate burdens to low income populations. Uh, as a test here, I, I ran a disparate impact analysis for adding the Route 45 to the Chariots Network in TBEST. Uh, this analysis compares the two transit networks, A being uh, the network without Route 45 and B uh, the network with Route 45. It calculated uh, the disparity in terms of a quote unquote minority burden uh, and comparing scenario A with scenario B uh, shows that only 6.5% uh, had a percent disparate, um, which is lower than the 20% threshold set by our policy. Uh, therefore, uh, there was not a disparate impact to minority populations by adding Route 45 to the Chariots Network. Uh, in the past, uh, we used GIS with a labor intensive process to make these calculations. And we're really happy to have TBEST to do the hard work for us now. <laughs> Next slide. The strength of TBEST is the rich data set that predicts ridership based on socioeconomic census data that is coded down to the parcel level. Uh, you can see in this slide, a blown up section of uh, East, uh, East Salem, uh, where you can see the individual parcels. Each one of those circles represents a certain property. Uh, and for instance, the, the reddish color is, are the commercial properties and the larger the circle is, the, the more commercial activity uh, or personal trips we're expecting from those parcels. And then all of those small beige circles are the residential. Um, and so the, the table gives you a, a summary for the entire network. Uh, I believe this is also including uh, the regional system. Um, and it gives a, a percent market area there as well. Uh, this is really exciting for us uh, to be able to calculate potential ridership levels uh, uh, with just some small adjustments uh, to routes, which we might be looking at on, on the short-term level, uh, TBEST is sensitive enough to predict the ridership differences uh, that we may be looking at in the future. So uh, just wanted to show you the robust nature of the data there. Next slide. Uh, here's an example of how we use TBEST to help with um, the city of Salem in their uh, planning for their climate action plan. Uh, we worked with the city uh, and their consultant to look at what a, a scenario of increased transit, ser um, sorry, uh, this, was, this was not increasing transit service levels at all, but uh, just testing what the effect would be uh, if 
business access transit lanes or bat lanes were built on all of our core network streets. Um, on the, the map on the left shows all of the stops created within a half mile of a core network street. Uh, all of the routes traveling on these streets were given special characteristics to uh, give them a higher ridership score. Uh, the chart on the right uh, shows how we can designate levels of exclusive guideway and signal preemption priority for each route. That's what's circled there in red. Uh, the two in this instance is two out of five. Um, so this route uh, had a, a shorter length uh, than its entire route. Um, so it was given a score of two. Anyway, you can see the, the resulting uh, ridership boost down below is 17% uh, under the customer service category, 16% uh, for physical presence, 5% for image. Um, and these are uh, built into T-Best for bus rapid transit lines. Um, anyway, uh, this gives you an idea of how T-Best can be uh, uh, the different scores that you can set in order to adjust uh, different transit amenities. Next slide. Uh, then we were able to produce an annual summary for uh, the two different scenarios. Uh, the one, uh, the first one being October 2019 base without the bat lanes and scenario two uh, represents the core network bat lanes in place. Uh, you can see an increase of only about 700,000 riders per year uh, when all things, uh, everything else has been maintained uh, consistent. So this is not modifying frequencies on the routes or improving marketing of the routes themselves, uh, just keeping all things consistent. Um, so we were able to show the city uh, that simply adding the bat lanes uh, would not increase the ridership much more than about 22%. In the future, we could model increased frequencies and coverage among other things. Uh, this is just another illustration of how TBEST can be used to help inform board policy and investment decisions. Uh, where we didn't have a great qu quantitative tool at our disposal even six months ago. Now we have T-Best, which will uh, be helping us to make those data-driven decisions and give the board positive ridership pred predictions to make sound policy decisions. Next slide. Uh, for the Long Range Transit Plan project, T-Best will be used along with the SCATS regional travel demand model to develop alternatives in the 5, 10, and 20-year time horizons. Having two models will strengthen the result of the long-range transit plan, uh, future recommended networks. Uh, and just as an example, the current uh, regional travel demand model that SCATS uh, maintains, uh, that 20-year model does not assume any additional coverage in the Salem-Kaiser region. Uh, they only increase the frequency of the routes in that um, in that 20 year network. So uh, hopefully with the long range transit plan, uh, we will be able to uh, with community feedback and all the process that goes into the long range plan, uh, we'll be able to show a more robust network with increased geographic coverage and accessibility to transit in those 10 and 20 year time horizons. Um, and last of all, I would like to mention that uh, Chariots has started a T-Best users group for Western state uh, transit agencies and users. Uh, we're meeting every two to three months to share successes, ask, ask questions, and in general, share knowledge about all things T-Best that everyone can benefit from. Agencies such as Whatcom Transit in Bellingham, Washington, TriMet in Portland, Cascades East Transit in Bend, and Valley Metro in Phoenix, Arizona are participating as well as uh, the Service Edge Solutions consulting team. So we're really enthusiastic and uh, wanting to learn from all these different agencies as well. Next slide. 
Now I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. Are there any questions for Mr. Stonecliff? Director Duncan. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this presentation. When I saw this was going to be on the docket, I was incredibly excited. Um, so my first question was when we were talking about access to businesses, uh, there wasn't a, like a, what are, what are we defining as access? Is it also a fourth of a mile or a half mile? So in general, with our high frequency transit routes, uh, which are like the Route 21, the Route 5, Route 19, Route 11, uh, we are, uh, in general, national, national uh, studies have shown that people are willing to walk up to a half a mile uh, to access high frequency service. Uh, so 15 minute frequencies or, or uh, greater frequencies. Um, so, in, so that's why uh, I showed the half mile buffer for Route 21. Uh, but uh, we can certainly look at a quarter mile for those other routes that are not running as, as frequently because that's really the national standard for accessibility uh, to transit when it's not frequent transit. So if that makes sense. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, and then my follow-up question was that on the parcel level detail, sorry, this is kind of my favorite kind of stuff. So sorry if this is too detailed and let me know if you need to get back to me. Um, but you, I saw that the numbers, it said that the percent of market area, we were at a 27% for residential. Let's see if I can pull that up and make more sense. Um, so the T-Best parcel level detail, land use for the area that you brought up as an example, um, the percent of the market area covered was 27%. Do you know if we have like a target that we're looking for or how we feel about that number? I'm just, just curious. That's a good question. Uh, uh, in terms of, of land use, um, uh, you know, it, we generally look at the type of residential rather than uh, residential as a whole. Uh, so we try to serve multifamily housing uh if we can because those those housing units are generally higher ridership than single family dwellings um so yeah in in slide 14 um uh, that example is really looking at the chariot system as a whole um uh, we don't necessarily have a target uh but that's an interesting question i'll have to think about that and and get back to you um maybe i can pose that question to our users group and, and see what the national pr practice is doing. Thank you very much, I really appreciate it. Other questions? Director Carney. Thank you, President Davidson. And thank you, Ted, for this amazing presentation. I did not appreciate this tool from the slide deck that was in the packet. Mm -hmm. um, I can't, like, where was this when I was in grad school? <clears throat> It's just an incredible incorporation of GIS into another tool. It's like Esri lost their patent or something. I'm, I just, I can't say how thrilled I am to see all of this information being incorporated into a more user-friendly tool that can help transit districts everywhere. Um, just, wow. Um, so a couple of questions, and these are kind of nerdy um, GIS questions, maybe, at least the first one. I noticed in the slides um, that we're doing sort of the, well, most of them are doing a geographic analysis, but beginning on the access to transit analysis slide, it's hard to tell in my packet, but it was easy to tell in the presentation um, that it's using a Euclidean geometry. So it's using an as the crow flies buffer. And I'm wondering, um, is that a limitation of the data that's available for our metro planning area in particular, because we don't have a, a network analysis to do based on sidewalks? And if we did have that data, could we perform a network analysis? Thank you for that question, Director Carney. Uh, yes, uh, it is possible to bring a sidewalk network and uh, say a, a quarter mile walk distance uh, shape into uh, and and we have that shape um, in GIS that we could bring in and and use that instead of uh, what you say is uh, correct. It's it, currently it's uh, or what I showed on slide nine there is just 
uh, a simple as the crow flies quarter mile from each transit stop. Um, but yes, it is possible to bring in a, a, a different shape and uh, do the analysis with that instead. So would, you're bringing in the shapes from GIS? So are you exporting a shape file from GIS into this tool to perform the analysis? Uh, so with the, uh, the the example that I provided, that was created uh, directly in TBEST. Uh, TBEST uses ArcGIS um, uh, directly and is is using the tool uh, in many cases. Uh, there's there's also uh, different things like park and ride sheds, walk sheds, bicycle sheds, even transit sheds that. Um, it will uh, use a third party uh, service to build a kind of uh, shape. Say you can say uh, a 10 minute park and ride shed. Uh, and we did this for the Salem to Albany project where we were looking at um, uh, users that may access uh, that potential route in the city of Albany uh, like a, a 10 minute park and ride shed we, we built uh, in order to bolster uh, and create more of a, a realistic number for park and ride. Um, so uh, yeah, to, be, to answer your question, you could, there are many things, many more things that you can do in TBEST than you can just with GIS because of the compatibility and um, uh, the scripting tools. Uh, it's too much to I'd be happy to have a side conversation if you like on <laughs> all the details. Um, I'm, I'm sure that I could really get into something like that, Ted. Um, one last question about this uh, is on the slide that was maybe third, the Chariot's TDP annual summary. It's, it's hard to see the numbers in the staff report and it's, it might be my monitor is solution, but some of the percents um, end up being over 100%, and I, I could see it more clearly on your presentation, and I'm just not um, sure what that means. So is this on slide 12? Um, that's a, an alternative yeah, analysis. Right, no, right there, data-driven. So when we oh, look okay. at percent population served, I've got 132 and 131 and percent employment served. Right. Uh, yeah, I'll have to look into that. I don't know the answer offhand, but uh, my guess is that um, uh, because we were looking at uh, a future scenario, uh, and so it's it's growing that population from the base. So, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll look into that and get back to you. <laughs> okay. Oh no, I, I can, I can kind of see why that um, maybe would make sense, but um, yeah, I mean, if, if you wanted to get back to me on that, it's just kind of a, a quirk of the data, but like in general, blown away. Thank you for the presentation. I am very, very excited that Chariots has access to this tool. And I'm also, um, very happy to hear about the the leadership that Chariots is taking in convening a work group about this of um, different transit districts. I, I just see nothing but benefit there. So great work. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Oops. Urgent or Director Navarro, please. Uh, thank you, President Davidson. Uh, thank you, Ted, again, for, for putting this together for us. I just have a quick question. Um, I noticed in the beginning you mentioned that this tool uses um, observed ridership to uh, predict the, the feasibility of routes. And um, I was wondering, is COVID going to, and ridership that's in, been impacted by COVID, is that going to impact the effectiveness of this tool? Thank you for that question, Director Navarro. Uh, currently, we are not looking at uh, data that's any newer than 2019. Uh, October 2019 was pre-COVID and that's our most reliable data set. Uh, that said, um, looking at our uh, looking at our future and how we're implementing our ITS solutions on our vehicles, uh, 
we will want to look at some more recent data than 2019, um, uh, say in the next 12 months. Uh, but at this time, um, we only have the, the 2019 data to work with. Uh, it is possible to bring in stop level data as well. Uh, and uh, we're excited to be able to do that. But unfortunately, right now, our uh, onboard automatic passenger counters, uh, uh, we're working out some bugs with, with those uh, hardwares right now on the buses. And so we're not able to use that data at this time. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, maybe in the next, uh, hopefully in the next six to 12 months, we'll be able to, to look at that uh, more, more recent data. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a couple questions. I'm, I'm wondering the portability of this. Is this something that we could engage the community with, especially as we're working to develop our long range plan? Absolutely. I think uh, the outputs are, are intended to assist in uh, public outreach. Um, it's, if you're familiar with the tool Remix has developed, um, that tool specifically, uh, ha, uh, we've actually used that tool in some of our uh, public outreach events uh, two, three years ago, and uh, kind of in real time to show what it would be like to, you know, if somebody has a question, well, what if you put a route out in this direction? Well, we could bring TBEST to an outreach event and uh, you know, show what that uh, effect would be. And so answer questions directly on site, which is exciting. Um, so that's just one example, but I, I think there would be many more cases where we would be able to uh, use it in our outreach, just specifically for our long range plan. Great, thank you. In a similar vein, as we're projecting or looking into the, the future. Um, I th think I heard you answer maybe a variation of this question, but I, I want to maybe rephrase it, which is, are we able to pull in, like for example, the city of Salem is undertaking their uh, redo of their comprehensive plan. And so their our Salem process has some um, different kinds of uh, zoning. And so their expected growth, multifamily here, different kinds of zoning elsewhere. Can we pull in that preliminary data and then along with population projections to, I, I assume we can, but I, I wanna make sure that is the case. Thank you, President Davidson. Uh, yes, that is possible. Uh, we would need to work with our consultants to uh, build a, a, a new base scenario, essentially, uh, that would show all those land uses and, um, I, I suppose it, it would be up to the regional, uh, our SCATS MPO to determine uh, what those future uh, growth uh, growth patterns are, are like. And so for the long range plan, as an example, that's one major reason we're partnering with the SCATS MPO on the plan, uh, on the modeling so that uh, they do the predictions <laughs> For us, uh, TBEST really doesn't do land use or uh, population predictions. Those are really things that we need to get externally. Uh, but yes, we can import them uh, to, to create another base scenario, if that makes sense. Yeah, so, so it's not necessary. But if City of Salem was to hand you a bunch of shape files, you could probably pull those in and work. OK. Great. Yes. Um, the the testing of the the bat lanes that you um, modeled for us. First off, I love the name bat lanes. I think <laughs> we should name them bat buses, bat everything. Um, <laughs> but so for these uh, business and turn lanes, um, I when you mentioned you know additional seven hundred thousand riders and only a twenty two percent increase. You seemed a little underwhelmed by that figure, which is the opposite reaction I had. So could you help me understand what I'm missing? 
Sure. Thank you for that question, President Davidson. Yes, uh, we are underwhelmed by that number uh, because really to to make a difference, and, and this is really a question for this, the city of Salem's climate action plan consultant, uh, do they consider that enough of a benefit for the, the cost of implementing the bat lane infrastructure? Um, I think just in uh, cursory discussions with them, uh, they were uh, hoping that it would double the ridership. Um, they were looking for a much more robust uh, increase in ridership in order to um, make a difference in greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, they're doing their analysis. We could certainly support any further analysis that uh, they would like to do. But um, at this point, we only did a network that uh, did not increase frequencies, uh, did not increase the marketability of, of the routes. Um, you know, uh, theoretically, you could <laughs> you could make a light rail on all of these routes, or <laughs> something uh, you know, very uh, <laughs> outside of the box, so to speak. <laughs> but uh, we tried to to make it a little bit realistic. But uh, yeah, it was it was showing only seven hundred thousand, which was uh, a fairly small number in our books. Great, thank you for that. And I, I like the the lens that it, it sounds like you and the consultants were taking a biggest bang for your buck. And so I'm I'm. It seems to me that this tool would allow us to understand what those biggest returns on investments are, both us as operator and then our partners in government as the maintainers of the infrastructure. And so. I don't know if this this is probably a future presentation, but I would love to get a better sense of what those um, big ROI changes are, um, both to aid the city in meeting their climate goals, but also to just um, serve our riders better. And so just wanted to plug that out there as an as a interest point uh, that I would be interested in seeing. Yes, it, it would be great to uh, partner, uh, hear from the consultants uh, who's working with the city and see what their um, metrics are. Uh, but yes, uh, we could certainly partner with them. Uh, uh, and since Chariots is going to be developing its own climate action plan, we need to be consistent with the city's plan, of course. So <laughs> yes, I, I envision this tool being very useful for, for us and for them. Director Duncan. Thank you. Uh, following up on your question, uh, do we have a deadline that we need to have uh, th th that these bat lanes are going to be decided on or not? Uh, since we're also coming up with our own plan at the same time, it, it begs the question, could we come up with twice the amount of ridership if that's something that was a priority for us, you know, adding to these other, other pieces of the model that we originally didn't? Is there a deadline in which we would need to have that sort of projection? Thank you, Director Duncan. I don't think there's a deadline at this point. Um, uh, we need to get the consultant on board for our for our own climate action plan. And I, I suppose uh, General Manager Pollack could speak to this a little bit more, uh, but uh, I, th I think we would be coordinating with the city. Um, but at this time, we don't have any direct uh, guidance from them or, or deadlines for uh, what kind of network they're looking for. Thank you. To maybe follow up on that, did after you provided them the data from the bat lanes, did they say, okay, what else? Or were they just disappointed that it wasn't a doubling of ridership? Thank you, Director Davidson. Um, so they took their data back, uh, the, da the data that we gave them, the 700,000 number. And uh, to be honest, we didn't hear uh, exactly what the outcome was with that data. Um, my suspicion is that uh, they will be uh, developing a, a recommendation and if they need any further 
data support from us. Uh, we'll be happy to provide that, but uh, it's been a couple of months since we gave that uh, data to them and we haven't heard anything. So I'm, I'm assuming at this point, um, they're not furthering their analysis. Um, sorry, I don't have more information on that. No, no, not a problem. It's, it's not your responsibility. Thank you for working with them on this. Yeah. Absolutely. Other, oh yeah, Mr. French, um, we, we see your, your bright shining face here. Would you like to chime in? Uh, thank you, President Davidson. I was just going to say uh, we did have some ad additional or I had additional conversations with the city and this is really, they were trying to put a whole group of things together to put into a pot to, to say, to have, um, kind of things that they could do. And so their consultant is continuing to work on putting that list together. And so um, they were going to do more analysis as far as the cost of adding bat lanes, what that would cost as far as uh, getting right of way or those types of things and kind of do the cost analysis piece. We provided them the ridership piece of it and they were going to look into what it would cost to implement that type of stuff along uh, the core network. So I know that they're continuing to do additional work. And so I would guess that they may come back to us at another point in time. We left, and the core network, just for information for you, the, along the core network, not everywhere are we going to be able to provide um, that, that you know, dedicated right of way or, or bat lanes uh, along all of it, because there's places like going down Center Street, um, you're going through neighborhoods, you're not going to to take um, right of way from houses to put bus lanes going down that so it's we couldn't do it straight across but this tool allowed us to take a very high level and say if we did this this is kind of the results for them to be able to help build their complete story great thank you for that manager French any other questions please uh, thank you, uh, President Davidson. Uh, so, yeah, that's on. Uh, just one last question. Um, this, could this TBEST tool be used to um, project the effectiveness of a right, let's say Route 14, if it were to be extended out to Kaiser Rapids in Kaiser? Thank you, Director Navarro. Yes, absolutely. Uh, any route in our system, we can uh, make a copy of that route in any scenario of TBEST and, uh, you know, play with the alignment or play with the schedule and see what the effect has for ridership. Uh, so it's very powerful. You can uh, zoom in onto the parcel level and really s see what kind of uh, economic drivers those ridership uh, drivers are doing. And so we can uh, draw our routes more precisely so that we're serving those markets uh, where we will get more riders. Awesome, yeah, because uh, the Parks Board is working on a master plan right now and they're, they're looking into changing the way that, that Kaiser Rapids is built to be able to accommodate a turnaround for a bus because they know that that's part of the reason why um, buses don't go out there. So yeah, it'd be awesome to get some numbers for them and let them know how much it, it might help or it might not. Very good, yes. Sorry, one last question in that similar vein. I know of the land use types that you had listed on, I think slide 14, um, parks or recreation was not one of them. I'm, to, to Director Navarro's point, I, I think if we can account for that, I know City of Salem has recently been discussing a parks transportation issue at length. And um, so I, I think it's a topic of discussion that will continue. And so to the degree that we're able to account for those, I think that would be uh, wise. Thank you, President Davidson. Uh, yeah, I'll have to look into that. I, I believe it's possible to code those parks into TBEST, uh, but uh, apparently, yes, uh, we don't have that category currently. Um, maybe we need to get that from the cities of Salem and Kaiser uh, so that we can uh, put that data, those data 
into T-Best. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you. If there's no other questions or comments, um, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. So with the presentation portion of our agenda completed, uh, we'll go ahead and turn to public comment, um, which I believe we have not received any written comment and there's no members of the public present this evening. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and proceed to the consent calendar. So if there's no issues with the items on the consent calendar, uh, would someone please make a motion? I move to approve the consent calendar. We have a motion from Director Inohos Bresi. Is there a second? I second. Director Navarro with a second. Um, any discussion? Being no discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Then I. S did you? Did you get Director Richards? He opened his mouth. I so I. Well, l let's get him to unmute. Or if you'd like to raise your hand, Director Richards, I think that can work. Okay, <laughs> that counts. Okay. Um, we'll go ahead and proceed to our first and only action item, which is a authorization to execute a contract. General Manager Pollock. Yes, thank you. I'll ask uh, our CFO, Denise LaRue, to please come online and present the report. Good evening, President Davidson and members of the board. Tonight, I will be asking the board to authorize the general manager to execute a contract with the Gunter Group for project management and technical advisory services in the implementation of Tyler Muniz Enterprise Resource Planning and Human Resource Management software for a term of two years and a not to exceed amount of $500,000. District staff determined several years ago that the ERP and HRM system currently in use no longer met district needs. A solicitation led to the selection of Tyler Muniz ERP software as the replacement. Critical staff turnover and a shortage of staff to manage the implementation and testing necessary for a successful transition stalled the project. Staff determined that a complete project restart with external project management and technical services help from an experienced consulting group would be critical to achieving implementation success. On July 23rd, 2020, the district issued a request for proposal for ERP and HRM consulting services. The solicitation closed on August 24th, 2020. There were four proposals submitted three were determined to be responsive to the solicitation requirements. The decision, the decision of the Source Evaluation Committee was to recommend a contract award to the highest scoring supplier, the Gunter Group LLC, which has its home office in Portland. If executed, the terms of this contract would be for 24 months, commencing September 1st, 2021, and concluding on August 31st, 2023, with a not to exceed amount of $500,000. The amount of the proposed contract for these services is budgeted in the FY21-22 adopted budget as a capital project under the finance division in the capital projects fund. It is the staff's recommendation that the board authorize the general manager to execute a contract with the Gunter Group LLC for project management and technical services relating to the implementation of Tyler Muniz ERP and HRM software for an amount not to exceed $500,000. May I answer any questions? Are there any questions? Director Carney. Thank you, President Davidson. Um, and thank you for this presentation. I'm just curious why this is being considered under the capital projects budget and not more of an operating expense. Because the, the project is, is an entire software upgrade. And this is, this is part of the project, which is associated with being able to complete it.
Deputy General Manager Trimble, would you like to comment? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Kearney, for the question. So under the capital projects, there are capital, what we call capital and operating projects. And uh, this is actually designated as, as I, I think uh, Denise was trying to get to, as an operating project under our capital capital improvement plan. So in the capital improvement plan, you have capital uh, purchases, capital projects. So a capital purchase would be a bus, a capital project would be building something. And we also, also have operating projects or operating programs. So for example, this software package, some of, some of the other IT items. So technically it's listed as an operating project within our capital improvement plan. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that makes that's that's helpful. Thank you very much. Any other questions? All right, great. Well, we have an action item before us with a staff recommendation. Uh, would someone like to make a motion? I'll move um, that the board authorize the general manager to execute a contract with the Gunter Group LLC for project management and technical services relating to the implementation of Tyler Muniz ERP HRM software in the not to exceed amount of $500,000. We have a motion. Is there a second? A second. a second? We got Director Richards with a second. Thank you. Um, with a motion and a second, is there any discussion on the motion on the table? Being no discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. The motion is unanimous and motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll proceed to the informational reports, the first of which is the service change briefing, the best item on the agenda. So I'll ask service planning manager Chris French to please come back on and present the report. Uh, thank you, General Manager Pollock and uh, President Davidson, members of the board. Um, I'm here this evening to discuss the September 5th service change. Um, the service change will uh, bring Sunday service uh, starting September 5th and also uh, provide uh, holiday service starting in November with the uh, Veteran Day, Veterans Day holiday. <clears throat> With the change, uh, some notable changes that are happening are uh, Route 2 is um, returning to regular route. Uh, that route uh, was on detour because of a major uh, construction project, uh, adding bike lanes, sidewalks, and um, new stops along 45th Avenue. Uh, so we are going to be returning to regular route. Um, as well as the Route 12 will be returning to regular route with new stops along that section as well. The uh, Route 5, we are adding uh, two new stops along the Route 5 uh, close to the uh, uh, former uh, state hospital property. Uh, there's lots of uh, uh, multifamily housing going in there. And we had had previous stops there with, and there was nothing in that area, but with the return of that, uh, we're going ahead and reinstalling those stops to provide closer access to those um, facilities. Uh, route 13 has some minor uh, route changes coming into the tra transit center. Um, with the Sunday service, uh, there is a, a uh, short line of the route, of the Route 8. Uh, we are uh, term terminating it um, at Skyline and Kubler instead of continuing all the way over to commercial. Uh, we did this during the reduction of service, but this was planned with Sunday service. And the short line of the bus makes it so that it cycles in a 60 minute time period, uh, which allowed us to uh, turn on uh, the Route 13 by short lining it. Um, we would have had a half hour of, of layover time at the end of the route because the cycle time is an hour and a half uh, to to make that trip normally during the week. So with shortlining it, we were able to uh, 
maintain a 60 minute headway uh, along with turning a route on the 13, which is a heavily used route throughout the system, throughout our, with, uh, com compared to other routes on the system. Uh, for the regional system, uh, we will be adding uh, two trips to the Route 40X for Saturday. Um, so increasing the number of trips on the Route 40X and on the Route 45, uh, we will be adding two stops close to the new, uh, new development in Monmouth Independence uh, near the Roths and many other shopping areas. So those are the plan changes for September 5th. Um, as many people have heard and a memo went out today uh, with the current situation with COVID-19, uh, we are having to make some adjustments to our weekday, weekday service um, starting uh, this coming Monday and we will be reducing to 80% of our weekday trips. Uh, we had an 80% uh, service level um, in the past um, as we started looking at that package, if we could re-implement that, um, we were in a different point in time at that time. People were being asked to stay at home. Uh, people were working for, from home. And uh, so we uh, shortened the span of the service during that time um, to, to get to that 80%. Uh, with the 80% package that we are putting out on the street on Monday, we've left the span of service, uh, the full span, other than we won't do the 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock uh, pulses from downtown. So it'll be from the regular time that we start in the morning until the nine o'clock pulses will be the last pulse from downtown. The way that we've get, got to the 80% is we've reduced frequency um, or started uh, reduced frequency uh, on the core network routes, uh, not all day, but we've uh, moved most of the 15 minute service to start at 10 o'clock, which is where we really see that ramp up of, of our passengers moving around. And we are um, ending that at five and going back to half hour service at five, where we usually see that uh, steep decline. Um, so we're trying to make sure that people can get to where they need to go uh, throughout the whole entire day um, and not eliminate it completely. They may have to adjust their, their times that they have to leave in the morning, but there's still service and we're running all of the routes. Um, and with that, that concludes my uh, update on service and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Are there any questions? Director Duncan. Uh, just a quick point of clarification, please. Um, you said that we're not, the 10 and 11 p.m. pulses from downtown won't happen, but but they were still running the buses until 11 at the, on the other routes. Just, just, I was a little not clear. Uh, Director Duncan, Duncan, sorry for the confusion. We are, our last pulse will be at nine o'clock as opposed, so we are, we are shortening the span in the evening at 10 to nine o'clock. So the last pulse out of the transit center will be at nine o'clock. Mr. French, um, routes that don't, hit the downtown transit center like Route 11 though, they're also impacted as well, right? That, President Davidson, that is correct. But Kaiser Transit Center, the, there's a pulse out of Kaiser Transit Center. So the Route 11, um, it's, sorry, I'm lo looking through my notes here real quick. Um, it the last pulses are at nine o'clock from the Kaiser Transit Center and would be from the north end uh, right around nine o'clock. It may be a few minutes before or a few minutes after. Uh, I would have to look specifically at the schedule, but it's right around nine o'clock that the, the north and southbound would both leave and head and complete that full trip uh, north and south. Great, thank you. Director Duncan. Is this until further notice or is this for a limited duration? Uh, this is uh, until further notice. We will continue to monitor and look at the situation as far as uh, staff and and monitor it closely. And and as we see things improve, we will uh, switch to that 100% level um, that we have for the September package. We just uh, really needed to uh, get ahead of this and make sure that we are maintaining um, 
able to put out reliable service on, on, on the network and so that people know what it's going to be and so that we don't have um, early in the pandemic, uh, we had buses um, parked all over this uh, all over the place because they come in and if somebody if an opera if we're missing an operator we were parking them on the street we had agreements with the city but with the city open we couldn't just pull buses over on the side of the road and leave them sitting until so this is uh, preventative so that we can make sure that what we're saying we're going to put out there we are and people can rely on it thank you for helping make these hard decisions with uh, data informed uh, decisions so thank you other questions? Yeah, I've um, I, I appreciate the the looking forward, especially with the staffing short shortages around the um, preemptive reductions. And I'm I'm afraid to ask this question, but how how much give do we have until further reductions are needed? Uh, President Davidson. Uh, um, We've so we've been on a shoestring and it's it's been at the breaking point every day. Uh, the thing that that is pushing some of this is our extra board operators for the last couple of weeks have been working 17 hour shifts day after day and other operators filling in and helping. So it's the breaking point is there at any time. And plus, just the staff are exhausted and you can only run. Uh, you can only work those kind of shifts for so long before you start having people sick, not from COVID or just sick or safety issues, uh, distracted, uh, not fully rested. So um, that's that's where we're at. Uh, we've been they've been able to maintain service and get everything out on the road. But every single day um, we have two dispatchers that are sitting cutting up work and, and pushing it to all of the places to try to keep it on the road. And they have done a outstanding, phenomenal job. Yes, yeah, thank you for, for sharing that. And I will take a moment to maybe pontificate um, for a second here that uh, this is a pandemic that is raging through our community. And if, for those of you that may be tuning in at home, if you haven't been vaccinated yet, please get vaccinated. Uh, not only will you help your neighbors, but you will help your local transit system. And so um, uh, there's, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Maybe speak to it later, but thank you, uh, Mr. French for uh, letting us know not only how hard our, the Chariots team is working, but uh, how, how shoestring, uh, to use your word, how, how shoestring this is right now. Other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you, Mr. French. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we have fourth quarter performance reports. Yeah, so uh, uh, Chris took a look forward there. Now he's going to take a look back and report on this past fiscal year. So, uh, Service Planning Manager French, please. And thank you. Um, I'm here uh, to present the FY21 quarter one performance report. Uh, this covers April to June of 2021. Next slide. Uh, we'll look at rider total uh, first. Next slide. Uh, so on this slide, we're looking at weekday total ridership. Um, and with this uh, weekdays, uh, we provided uh, 1,537,581 rides on the local chariots buses. 47,775 cherry lift rides, uh, 52,785 uh, ch regional rides, 1,928 uh, on the deviated fixed route in Independence and Monmouth and Dallas, and the cherry shop and ride had 4,039. Um, with all of the uh, stuff that we've experienced in this year, uh, we are down still a lot, but this shows that we still are very va valuable in our community. Next slide. Uh, Saturday ridership, uh, we provided uh, 181,000, a little over 181,000 ride on the local system. Uh, Chariots Lift provided uh, just shy of 5,000 rides and Chariots Regional uh, 4,163 rides. Next slide. 
this slide uh, breaks down by month and we've done this for the last uh, so that you could see the difference in Saturday ridership uh, throughout the year. Um, with this slide, uh, it's comparing, it's showing the total ridership on the high spike days, as I've said in the past, uh, not all uh, months have the same number of Saturdays. So the really high spikes are usually because of the extra day of service. Uh, throughout the year, we've uh, averaged a little over 3,000 rides, uh, but in June was our largest month and we were just shy of 4,000 rides uh, per Saturday. Next slide. And for the total ridership uh, for the month or for the for the year, uh, we did 1.8 million rides, just over 1.8 million rides total for our system. And as I said earlier, yes, it's down, but the service that we provide in our community is still very important and uh, shows here that people are needing to get throughout our system. Next slide. Uh, next, we'll look at ridership averages. Next slide. So this looks at average daily ridership per month. And with this, you can see that <clears throat> we had that extreme drop off, uh, but we've uh, recovered and we're about 50% uh, of where uh, we were uh, pre-pandemic with the local system. Next slide. And with the regional system as well, uh, our recovering uh, and ridership is going up, uh, but we're still uh, not, we're just a little bit under 50% or a little over 50% for ridership for the local or for the regional system. Next slide. Next, we'll look at weekday averages by route. Next slide. So this uh, shows weekday rides per revenue hour, and that's kind of how you uh, measure efficiency. Um, our top performing route is the Route 21, which is the South Commercial, um, which averaged 14.7 rides per revenue hour. We have a goal of 20 boardings per revenue hour, so we're continuing to see these numbers climb. Um, the lowest on our on the system is the Route 17, which is Edgewater, uh, which uh, is in West Salem and is uh, just under eight boardings per revenue hour. Next slide. So the, the, these are our coverage routes, uh, less frequent, not on the core network. Uh, the Route 16, which is the uh, Wallace Road route. Um, and goes out Wallace Road to Brush College uh, is getting close to our, uh, our target of 10 boardings per revenue hour. Next slide. This is uh, the revenue hours for our regional system. Uh, our top performer is the Route 40X Polk County. Um, that serves the communities of Dallas, Monmouth, and Independence, and uh, we are at 3.7. Uh, and our lowest route is the uh, North Marion County Route 20, and that serves the areas of Silverton, Mount Angel, and Woodburn. Uh, all of them are underneath, but uh, underneath our target goal. But they have continued to see uh, riding, riders increase uh, over uh, the months. Next slide. Uh, next, we'll look at Saturday averages by route. Next slide. <clears throat> so uh, this is revenue hours, rides per revenue hours on the corridor routes. As you can see on Saturday, um, our efficiency goes up on the Route 21 South Commercial. Uh, we're getting closer on Saturdays to meeting that target of uh, 17 point, at 17.4. Um, with revenue hours, we're looking, so revenue hours, when you have fewer hours and more people, that's where you get efficiency. So during the weekdays, we have 15 minute service and, and high riderships. So uh, looking at this, uh, the 17.4, uh, the routes are very productive for them being half hour routes on Saturdays. Uh, next slide. Um, as with weekdays, Saturday, the Route 16 is our top for performer um, out in the Wallace Road Brush College area, uh, averaging at 8.5. Next slide. 
and as with weekdays, uh, the Route 40X is also the most productive uh, with six boardings and the Route 20X being the least productive with 1.2 boardings per revenue hour. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Manager French? Okay. Um, I don't see any questions, though I sure thought I had one. Um, oh, yes. Um, the 1.8 million total ridership for fiscal year 21, or year to date, rather. Um, could you remind me what we were averaging prior? Actually, I guess I know the answer. It's probably times two if we're around 50% right now. Yes, that would be correct. Okay. In that general area, yes. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, and I, I wanna echo the point you made earlier, um, which is, uh, I mean, that, that's a very big number. That's a big enough number that me as a kindergartner could not wrap my head around a big number. And um, that is remarkable that we're able to provide that many rides to uh, throughout the middle of a pandemic. I, I think that is uh, not only remarkable, but it is commendable. So thank you to everyone at Teams Chariots for making that possible. Um, please, John I could just add on that. I think that just goes to show uh, the true need for transit to be considered an essential service. Right. Because uh, uh, the people that are riding now are riding because they, we are their ride. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. All right, with that, um, thank you very much, uh, Manager French. We'll go ahead and proceed to the transportation options report. All right, thank you. And I'll ask uh, Roxanne Belts, our transportation options coordinator, to present the report. Thank you, General Manager Pollack. Good evening, President Davidson, members of the board, and uh, welcome Director Navarro and Director Duncan. This will be my first presentation to you. So I'm Roxanne Belts. I'm the Transportation Options Program Coordinator, and I'm here to present a summary of the fourth quarter activities for the Chariots Transportation Options Program. I'm presenting details about our outreach and other activities that my colleague, Kiki Doman, and I participated in during the fourth quarter. Next slide. The first part of my report is in relation to our goal area of raising awareness and understanding. Next slide. So this goal in our awareness and understanding is about community meetings. We attended 24 community meetings during the quarter that were attended by another 525 people. These meetings tend to be service integration team meetings and um, chamber functions. Next slide, please. For our new board members, let me explain an employee transportation coordinator are employees at local businesses and state agencies who we share, our program shares information with, and then they in turn share that information with their coworkers. They become the transportation expert within their work organization. We typically meet quarterly, although we have not had an in-person meeting for well over a year. Um, so what we did is we added the 60 plus um, ETCs, we call them the 60 plus ETCs. We added them to the Chariots e-news so that we were sure they were getting the information they needed about transportation. And as things changed, they got regular updates. Um, we do have some in-person meetings scheduled. Um, however, I suspect we'll be postponing those meetings now until next year sometime. Next slide, please. Another one of our goal areas is expanding our markets. Next slide, please. This goal includes the use of Get There Oregon, which is the online ride matching and trip tracking tool that we use. It's provided to us by ODOT. So in June, from June 1st to June 30th, we ran a, a pilot to test out one aspect of the tool no one had used called the team feature. It was a team challenge feature. We called it the Get There Games. We formed 20 teams just in the Salem-Kaiser area. And during the month of June, 
we had 1,099 trips that were logged by all those 20 teams, and that equated to um, a little over 10,000 miles saved by people not driving alone and choosing to either carpool, vanpool, a bike, walk, or telework. And then we did have support for prizes from four local businesses partners. I always like to recognize them. Bike Peddler, Santiam Bicycle, Commute with Enterprise, and Kettle Brand, which are the potato chip people. Next slide, please. Another aspect of our outreach is with our group pass program. When chariots decided to reinstate fares back in July, we were able to um, get Salem Health and the book bin to sign up again to be participants in our group pass program. What they do is they pay a very low rate to ensure that all of their employees, 100% of their employees has access to use transit for free. And that's our group pass program. Um, in terms of van pools, we have 15 van pools that we're operating now that we help subsidize. And um, we're definitely hoping that as the state agencies return to their office, that we'll grow that program back to where it used to be. We used to have over 40 vans operating. We do, however, we are working with two employers, one in Polk County and one in Yamhill County. We're helping them both build a commuter program for their staff and both of those programs include adding van pools. So more to follow on that. I'm excited to, to see where we can take those programs for those employers. Lastly, several months ago, a staff at ODOT asked if we would be a part of what they called their limited English proficiency advisory group. And the goal is to learn more about the barriers that these communities face when trying to use a transportation option. So that would include transit, but also biking, carpooling, vanpooling, et cetera. So the advisory group right now, they're working on ways that we can address, we as a program can address these barriers. We can develop programs and communication strategies that not only could our program use, but other programs similar to ours across the state could also use. Next slide, please. I'd mentioned earlier about Get There Oregon, the online ride matching tool that we use. This is self-reported data. So everyone that's within that uh, database, we notice how many active users we have. The numbers are growing steadily, um, not as quickly as we'd like. However, we know that uh, again, with the situation we're in, we have lots of people that are active and we're happy to see our numbers growing a little bit quarter to quarter. Um, definitely, we had an uptick in the fourth quarter and we will definitely see more people participate when we have our big challenge in October, which is the, the um, Get There Challenge. Next slide, please. Another goal area we have is for safety. Next slide, please. So we partner with the Safe Routes to School program in the Salem-Kaiser area, and they completed their first poster contest. And for those of you that don't know, we used to have a poster contest, but we transitioned it over to the Safe Routes to School program, and they did it for the first time and had a very successful campaign. They also are going to be getting training from ODOT on a school pool module that will be a part of the Get There tool. That will help them work specifically with schools to one school at a time forming carpools within, um, within parents that drive their children to school, parents or guardians. And that way it will just be within an individual school because that will give the parents a little bit more comfort knowing that they're just coordinating with other parents or other guardians at their child's school. So Safe Routes program will be working on that. We're also working on a roadway safety video. Um, the idea is to focus on the positive things that cyclists, vehicle drivers and pedestrians can do to ensure that they are safe and to ensure that they um, make sure they're protecting other people's safety, the other people's safety as well. Next slide, please. I'm just gonna finish up with a few activities that our team has been doing. Next slide, please. So Ride Salem Bike Share, they did resume operation a little while ago with the station at the Downtown Transit Center that um, is sponsored by our program. And our staff continues to work with Osborne Adventures, that is the operator of the program. And uh, as they need more promotion and when they're ready to do some outreach, we will be there to help them. And regionally, Bird Scooter has launched in the city of Monmouth. It's a soft launch where they will be targeting the Western Oregon University students as they start to arrive for fall classes. 
um, Bird has indicated that they would like to use this as, a, as an example and hopefully expand into Independence, Dallas, and they have their eye on Salem. Next slide, please. So as a member of the Monmouth Independence Chamber, I was also able to participate in another poster contest. So students in a graphic arts class at Western Oregon University were asked to create some tourism posters and they wanted to convey the activities and landmarks and historic icons within Polk County. So after the posters were submitted to the chamber, board members voted on their favorite and the top four winners received actual compensation for their work. Next slide, please. So the posters now hang in the Monmouth Independence Chamber office and the images will be continued to be used in advertising and promotional products that will be for sale by the chamber. That enjoy the ride down there, that was the number one vote getter and we'll definitely see that image again. Next slide, please. So in my last report, I shared that Kiki Doman was selected as the chairman of the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee for the Association for Commuter Transportation or ACT. And uh, she's been very busy with that committee and she's, they've developed their charter, they have their work plan, and um, she was part of a sponsored panel at the national conference. And of course, as you all heard earlier, she was just recognized with the president's extraordinary leadership award. Next slide, please. We've also completed an internal training presentation for chariot staff. It features the transportation options program and it's intended to help expand the knowledge of members of team chariots, um, specifically people that will be working at outreach events or working in customer service. Um, we know there are times where transit may not be the best solution for a rider. So we wanna make sure that our staff knows enough about the other options that might be available that they can guide that customer to help them find a solution. And as always, we've attended some trainings and some webinars on the Future of Commuting Summit, the FTA's increasing vaccine confidence among transit workers and building inclusive brands from the inside out. Next slide, please. With that, I am happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Director Duncan. Uh, thank you, President Davidson. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I am s thrilled to learn about more of these programs. Um, I specifically have a question about the group pass program that you said that Salem Health and the Book Bin are participating in. Is this available for other businesses? Is it ongoing enrollment? Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Certainly. Thank you for the question. It, it is available to a wide variety of organizations, not just businesses. It's available to apartment complexes, to shopping mall employees. Um, it is a program where they will set up, uh, they'll set up the amount of people that are, are in their group. Let's say it's an office building that has 45 people in it. They may, at the Equitable Center is a good example. They're not all the same employer, but they all work in the same building. Um, the management organization could work with us. We establish a set fee per person per quarter and it's a very low rate it's somewhere around four or five dollars per person don't quote me but it's around that amount and then they agree to pay that quarterly and then every one of those people within that facility can ride the bus for free they either use their employee id or it's an issued id that we give them or we validate their employee id with a sticker could you send me some literature on that <laughs> potentially? I'd be happy to. Okay, that would be fantastic. I just, I already know people that would potentially be interested. Um, I think that's all I have for the moment. Thank you very much. Absolutely, my pleasure. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good evening. Uh, next. Up is our general manager's report. Great, thank you very much. So I, I would like to just start my comments by reiterating a little bit about uh, service planning manager French's comments. Um, I, I just want you to know and those listening that uh, the decision to come to the 80% service reduction did not come easily and uh, you know, I could see the frustration on staff uh, as they were grappling with making these kind of recommendations. But I want to uh, uh, applaud them for looking ahead because they had to work weeks ago 
just in case something, hoping it wouldn't happen, but it, but it has. Uh, and so uh, they have uh, uh, done a great job to prepare and, uh, and begin that implementation. Uh, and he also talked about transit operators working 16, 17 hours a day. I tell you, there's a core group of transit operators who have just stepped up and uh, working on their days off, working long extra days uh, because of their commitment to making sure this community is moving, moving and connecting to the places they need to go. And so uh, I, I, if they're watching, I just want to uh, acknowledge uh, that uh, their commitment has been noted uh, and greatly appreciated not only by me and the staff, but the community. You know, COVID has been tough uh, uh, and the Delta variant is making it even more so. But that's not the only impact we're facing. COVID is a piece of it. Uh, we've had s multiple retirements. It, you've seen around this community and nationally the difficulty in recruiting people for jobs. Uh, I was on my monthly app to call on Monday, and that was one of the major topics, you know, people trying to get creative, recruit people to come to work. Uh, so it, just know it's not just us. Um, and it's not just us doing service reductions. Several agencies talked about it. We were talking with our union leadership today and they were sharing the struggles TriMet's having making service. Uh, I believe Lane Transit's still at a 70% service level today. Uh, so if you're wondering, well, what, what's going on with chariots? Well, the same thing that's happening to many agencies. Uh, not to make that as an excuse or as okay, but I can tell you uh, uh, the struggle to come to those decisions are becoming very difficult and I applaud the staff for, for the work that they have done. Um, but uh, given that, we will uh, move forward on the 80% and as soon as we are able, we will resume service. Uh, the staff, it was critical that uh, we just reduce service on the weekdays and we were able to maintain the Saturday and then introduce that Sunday service. If you remember, Sunday service was supposed to be here over a year ago um, and we didn't want to lose the momentum that that has had. Uh, and that is already at a reduced level of service. So uh, uh, it's important we kept those services. Uh, so I think, I think that's what I wanted to say about that. Um, so earlier I talked about being on a call with APTA. So I was uh, uh, elected again by my peers to uh, fulfill a full term as chair of the Small Operations Committee. I was currently serving a vacant uh, slot when the uh, previous chair was promoted to a uh, a mid-sized operation and so no longer was eligible and I was the vice chair so I completed his term and has been elected uh, to fulfill a, a full term. Uh, I talked about Sunday service a little a while ago. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am to see that happen. Um, for those that have been around for a while, you know, to talk about this and finally see it come to fruition is, is uh, significant uh, for this organization. Uh, and then a couple more things. Uh, you've all been noticed that the Hispanic Heritage uh, Monthly Breakfast uh, is coming up in September. Uh, uh, Patricia Feeney is heading that up for us. So between her and Linda, we'll reconfirm those who have already committed to attend and see if there's any others. This is a great opportunity. Uh, if it still happens uh, in person, uh, it may go back to virtual like last year, but uh, uh, it's important uh, uh, that we sponsor these types of activities. And speaking of sponsorships, so if you see over in the far corner, uh, Kaiser recently had their Kaiser Fest and uh, we are a sponsor of that event. And you can see uh, uh, our sponsorship recognition uh, painting as well as pictures of what our bus that was in the parade looked like. So if you have time afterwards, please go take a look at it. Uh, and that concludes my report. Great. Thank you, Jarwin Andrew Pollock. We'll go ahead and proceed to the Board of Director reports. And um, next up, or actually, since Director Wynn's not here, it's uh, Director Navarro. Uh, thank you. Um, I, don't, I don't really have much to report. That's all right? All right, thanks. Great, thank you. <laughs> And, and actually, before we, we proceed too far, uh, in the agenda packet, um, I'm sure you've all noticed, but uh, starting on page 81 to 83 are the new um, 
Transit Board committee membership assignments. Um, so for some of you, this will be a change um, on a couple items for um, new members like Director Duncan, Director Navarro. Uh, there'll be brand new assignments. So um, looking forward to all the, these different ways that we can serve our community. So uh, looking forward to hear reports on those kind of things. Uh, Director Carney. Thank you, President Davidson. Um, let's see, not a lot to report from me. I do want to congratulate uh, General, Mal General Manager Pollock on his Small Operations Committee Chair position. I think I have that right for APTA. Um, I just, I so appreciate all of your involvement and leadership with that organization. Um, I think it really brings a lot to the Transit District, so thank you. Um, and I apologize to my colleagues uh, for not being there in person this evening. Uh, we're just a little hesitant around here with four smart, small children at home. If anybody gets COVID around here, nobody gets to go to daycare. <laughs> <Now> <laughs> just <laughs> probably be more than I could bear at this point in the pandemic. Um, so we're doing our best to <clears throat> keep our distance and avoid gatherings. So thanks for understanding. Um, I did attend earlier this week um, the SCATS meeting. So that's the Salem-Kaiser Area Transportation Study. Um, and there were a few noteworthy uh, items on the agenda. Um, one we talked about last month, which is update to a project on the current transportation improvement program. Um, it's an ODOT project that is seeking to realize improvements on sections of I-5, it has been in, it's been on the transportation improvement plan since I think for like 20 years. It's got a 20 year old environmental impact statement as part of the support documents. Um, so there's finally funding for it. Um, and the hope is that it relieves some congestion. Um, and we we will see if, if that does indeed come to fruition. Um, the, the most exciting thing, I think, uh, that was on the agenda that we discussed are the timelines for revision to the Transportation Improvement Pro Program, um, and which is called the TIP. So if somebody says the TIP, that's what they're talking about, at least in this case. Um, and the Regional Transportation Systems Plan, the RTSP. So the TIP is a short, sort of shorter term plan uh, for funded or projects where we have identified funding for implementation and the RTSP is a longer term plan and things generally will move from the RTSP to the TIP when it becomes a shorter term document. And by some quirk of alignment, let me scroll down in my packet here from the SCATS committee to this item. Um, by some quirk of scheduling, they are both scheduled for update um, kind of around the same time. And I just, I don't want to misquote it here, so I'm going to get down. So the Transportation Improvement Program schedule starts September 2021, um, and the, the RTSP program starts a bit later but they both will be adopted in like February, March of 2023. So that probably sounds like it's a long time away to people um, and it isn't right around the corner, um, but in the transportation planning world, um, it's coming up pretty soon. I mean, it's a very full schedule between now and then. So I bring it up because I think there are good opportunities for our board to be involved and good opportunities um, for me as a, the SCATS representative and perhaps for Director Duncan, who I think will be um, attending as well, or um, perhaps in my stead if need be. Um, but to, to bring the issues that are coming before SCATS to the board for discussion, um, maybe request some presentations about ways that we could be involved. Um, because these are, these are big plans um, that affect our entire metropolitan planning area um, and they're long-term plans in some case, um, some cases, you know, particularly the RTSP. So very exciting stuff there. Um, and then the last piece that I will tell you about, I believe the SurveyMonkey survey is still open. The public, 
let me make sure I understand what all these P's are about. It's the PPP public survey. So I think it's the public participation plan uh, public survey. So there's a survey open by SCATS right now trying to engage folks about how they would like to be contacted about this information. Um, there's a there's kind of a general feeling at SCATS that people don't know what SCATS is or what a COD does. And I would say that's probably in general quite true. <laughs> um, but so the, the public participation um, program that they're putting together is something that will accompany the updates of the, the TIP and the RTSP. Um, so they're just kind of getting that spun up at the time. They really have um, some great attention on it and are, are very open and receptive um, to ideas about creating more equitable inclusion. Um, so yeah, I would encourage you to take the survey um, if, if you like, um, and I'm happy to share more information about the process as it move, moves forward if others are interested. Um, and that's the end of my report. Great, thank you, Director Carney. Director Enojo Espressi. Um, I don't have much to report on the Citizens Advisory Committee. We have a meeting coming up next month, um, and I do see that Director Navarro is now my alternate, so I mean, would definitely like to see you in there as well. Um, but I am going to help out Director Wynn, um, since she's not here today, and just give this brief report on the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Um, all right, so since the last report, uh, Keen Independent Research has prepared a fact sheet and content for the study webpage, uh, also conducted background research on the Salem area, and scheduled kickoff meetings for the internal stakeholder committee, which is gonna be August 30th, and then the board subcommittee, which is August 31st. Um, I'm definitely excited to see the progress that we're making here on this DEI committee. And that'll conclude my reports. Great, thank you. I'm next up. Um, wanted to um, again say how excited I am for Sunday and holiday service. Um, I'm particularly fond of holiday service, though I, I think Sunday service is rightly getting its due. Um, and the reason I am so uh, fond of holiday service is because of a personal experience. In 2016, I got a ride to my job, and then I uh, went outside and waited for a bus, kept on waiting, kept on waiting. And it was only until an hour in that I realized, oh, it's President's Day. And so um, that three mile walk home made it clear to me that our region needed holiday service. And so I, I'm thrilled that um, come Veterans Day and then all those uh, many holidays later that we'll, we'll have holiday service. So um, in terms of uh, reports on uh, some of the things I've been working on, um, the First is General Manager Pollock and I, we were recently interviewed by uh, KMUZ's Willamette Wake Up, just giving a general update on uh, the things Chariots has been working on. And so uh, there was a lot of ground to cover because Chariots has been doing a lot of great work. So it was uh, great to um, kind of share some of the, the things that we've been able to accomplish and all the many challenges that this organization has weathered uh, these past two years. Um, in addition, um, I have been uh, chatting with some, some staff about an update to our vehicle acquisition policy. And before staff can move any uh, further on that, I uh, wanted to get um, the concurrence from the board on, on this. So um, in very broad strokes, I'm interested in seeing our uh, vehicle acquisition policy updated to reflect a goal of 2040 of having our whole fleet, so that's um, not only our bus fleets, but also our non-revenue fleet, so maintenance vehicles, maintenance trucks, uh, paratransit, every, everyone, every single vehicle we have um, being transitioned to a zero emission vehicle. And so um, of the particulars of what that looks like, uh, I'm not too particularly concerned if that's hydrogen, if that's uh, battery electric, if that's trolley electric, uh, I, I think our staff are more than capable to make those kind of decisions, but I would like um, us as a board to start heading in that direction um, for many reasons, one of which is that um, I think riding a bus uh, will be uh, 
a lot more enjoyable. I think buses in our community, uh, they will be quiet and clean. Um, but I think more, most pressing is uh, that we are facing a crisis, that the International Panel on Climate Change recently released their report, their 2021 report, and uh, they stated for the first time ever that climate change is unequivocally caused by humans. Uh, and that means all of us, that means all of our actions. And so we as a trans transit district, I think we have a responsibility not only to our current riders and to our community, but also to future generations, my daughters included, to our, <laughs> and that little guy right there. Um, so uh, there's a lot more to this than just our vehicle fleets, but that's one piece of it. And so um, that is great, I love that. Um, so if the board concurs with this, uh, I think staff can go ahead and start moving forward on, on some of the actions on developing what a, a changed vehicle acquisition policy looks like. Sorry. I want to say at least gauge the temperature. Okay, any nods? Yeah, can I just say like, heck yes? <laughs> <laughs> we'll note that in the record. <laughs> Great, okay, thank you. Um, and uh, that is all I have for my report for um, this evening. So Director Duncan. Thank you, uh, President Davidson. So uh, I attended Kaiser Fest and a couple of different greeters just trying to get engaged with the community and the Latino Business Alliance, which is now become, I think, one of, not that I'm supposed to have favorites, but it was, it was the highlight of my month. Um, I really enjoyed that group and I'm really excited to go back again. Um, I also, I know that RJ said that he didn't have anything exciting, but I heard through the grapevine that you represented us very well at a town hall this last month. Is that true? Uh, yeah, I, I, I just realized that we weren't streaming that part of the meeting when I talked a little bit about that. But yeah, we, we uh, had a great meeting with, with Senator Merkley. I just wanted to thank you for that, because like I said, I didn't hear that from you. I heard that from the community. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, and then the last little bit I have to say is I, I met with somebody who works um, in employment today um, for reasons outside of chariots. And one of the things that they brought up to me was that one of the conversations that they're having a lot with employers who are having trouble finding employees was if they do or do not have access to public transit for their business. Because she says that the people that they're now pulling from to hire are not traditional hiring pools. And they are people that more likely rely on transit than before. And I just wanna highlight how important our work is and uh, how thankful I am that we are still even operating at 80% when we're really in this difficult time because um, the employers need us to, to be able to even get people to the job interviews to hire them so that we can you know, keep things running. So I just wanted to share that. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Director Duncan. Director Richards. It's the button in the bottom left corner. And Ross, we can't unmute him from here. Okay. Director Richards, if you wanna try, you could hold down the space bar. It'll act kind of like a walkie talkie and then you should be able to speak as long as you're holding down the space bar. Oh, nope, okay. Yeah, we can't hear you. If you'd like, we can uh, maybe get your report after the fact and uh, put it in the minutes. Is that appropriate? Maybe. Yeah, okay. All right, sorry about that, Director Richards. Oh, wait, help might be on the way.
we can hear you. Hey. Well, I, my is, I was just going to say, it's been one of those months where everybody I know has been down. And so I have not done that as much as I would like. We did a little, I worked a little with Northwest Senior Services and a little bit with SRC, which is a voc rehab group that I work on. But I, I'm going to be ill and I probably will miss next month. So unfortunately, I, I just thought I'd let you know a little advance. Okay, thank you so much, Director Richards. Um, with that, that concludes uh, all of our agenda items and concludes our meeting. Uh, thank you very much to everybody who participated um, both in the meeting and also in preparation for this meeting and most importantly for uh, keeping everything running and keeping our community running. So thank you. Uh, we're adjourned. <laughs>